How many of you, as my father put it to me years and years and years ago, have come from the wrong side of the tracks? Hmm. You know what that will avoid? Okay. <laughs> Is there any disagreement here? My father used to say when we passed by somewhere in London, oh, that's how the people live on the other side of the tracks. But he said it in so many streets that I was confused when I was young. I didn't know how many sides of the tracks there really were. Did the wrong side of the tracks, the wrong part of town, have a name? Other than just don't go there? Hmm. Well, guess what? Probably every one of us, at one point or another, whether for a short period of time or a long season, has been in the wrong side of the tracks. Whether we grew up in a swanky estate or a standard suburban splanch. Do you know what that is? A split level ranch. A splanch. Or a shanty in the woods or a slum in downtown urban center somewhere. We've all spent time on the wrong side of the tracks. And we wonder when we're there, who is going to come and help us get back on track, on the right side of the tracks? Well, Jesus was born into a very specific side of the tracks. He grew up in the first century, very much a Torah-observing Jewish male in Israel. All around Jesus were all sorts of other sides of the trap. And in order to keep the Jewish faith alive and the Hebrew identity strong and pure in such an environment, strict laws separated. Oh, he's not bothering you. Is he bothering you? Strict laws separated the people of Israel, the right side of the tracks, from everybody else on the wrong side of the tracks. There were even strict laws within the nation, the Hebrew faith of Israel, that separated those that kept the laws better from those who were a little bit more lax in keeping the laws of God. Separated all manner of peoples, other tribes, and other travelers who happened to be living in amongst God's people of Israel. The laws of keeping kosher meant an observant Jew could never sit down to eat a meal with a non-Jewish person, called in those days a Gentile. And even simply to enter the home of a Gentile, or just as bad, to enter the home of a Jewish person who wasn't keeping all the laws of God properly, meant that you were immediately, if you were an observant Jew, you were immediately impure. You were defiled instantly. And one reason why Jewish tax collectors, do we have any tax collectors here today? <clears throat> no. Tax season's over, right? Okay. <clears throat> At least we hope it is. One reason why Jewish tax collectors were considered such outcasts and ostracized from within their own people, Israel, was because of their profession. Their profession required them to be in constant physical contact with the Gentile Roman rulers. So by virtue of their jobs, they lived in a continuous state of religious impurity, of defilement. <clears throat> For first century law-abiding observant Jews, there were very clear insiders and outsiders. Any of you ever remember in elementary school or high school when you were being picked to be on a team there were two captains who were obviously the jocks and they picked their teams. Were you ever on the inside and you were one of the first ones picked? Or were you on the outside, like me, last one to be picked? Except for baseball when they discovered what an arm I actually had. You were never on the outside? Oh, you were always on the outside. The wrong side of the tracks are extensive. 
And they encompassed everybody who was not a part of Israel. And yet, throughout the stories of the Old Testament, as well as through the New Testament, there are people who were clearly outside the accepted in-group of God's people. There were these outsiders that God clearly used to be in a good relationship with his own people and to draw them back on track. Those people who thought they were never off track. Jesus was always wandering around. He could care less what side of the tracks he traveled to, literally and figuratively. Jesus touched people's lives and changed them. He healed lepers. He touched them. Something you were not supposed to do, or the ones you became immediately religiously impure, unclean, defiled. He touched and healed madmen. He touched and healed people who had died. He offered living water to a Samaritan woman with a sketchy moral pedigree. He engaged in conversation with and opened the door for a Syrophoenician woman so that she might obtain healing for her daughter. He encountered so many people outside of the Jewish faith and even those within the Jewish faith who were considered completely on the outside. And he touched them with God's embrace of love and grace. And in today's text, as Jesus enters the city of Capernaum, his reputation has preceded him since he is known to a certain centurion, a Roman soldier in charge of 100 men. And remarkably, this centurion sends the members of the local Jerusia, in Greek, from which we get the word geriatric. He sent members of the local board of elders of the synagogue to seek Jesus out and to ask him to beg him to heal this Roman centurion's servant who was close to death. This delegation of Jewish elders did exactly what the Roman centurion asked them to do. And they explained to Jesus that this soldier, a symbol of the hated Roman presence that now ruled Israel, that he is nonetheless worthy of Jesus' compassion, his time and attention. Why? Because the centurion, they said, he loves, and you know the word for love there in Greek? is God's particular type of love, agape love. He loves our people, the Hebrew peoples. And not only that, this Roman centurion provided the funds to build our Jewish synagogue, where we go and we worship God. Under first century rules of patronage and reciprocity, it's now not so surprising that these Jewish elders did exactly what the Roman centurion ask them to do, to seek out Jesus and tell him, please, heal the centurion's daughter. They themselves were socially obligated by the patronage system of the day. There's a cartoon which shows a man kneeling beside his bed saying his prayers. And in part of his prayer he says, Oh God, is there any way that you can help me but make it look like I did it myself. We chuckle a little bit, and maybe not outrageously out loud, because does that hit close to home? Because we really like to think that we've done it all ourselves. We are always playing part of war with ourselves, with our identity, and with our worthiness. We judge ourselves. We assess who we are and what's important to us it is an operational need within all of us. What makes a person worthy? We judge everybody all too often. We judge their worthiness and therefore whether they're in or whether they're out. And usually we ask them, you know, a person's worthiness comes from their outward signs, the things that they do, and not just the things they say. The elders of the Jews wanted Jesus to know in, in absolute terms that this Roman centurion was worthy 
of his care because of what he had done. He showed us, the Hebrew people, his love. And he gave us all this money and built us a synagogue. Now that was quite remarkable for that day. The centurion, the Gentile, a non-Jew, who was friendly and on good terms with the Jews. The rule of the day was not love and respect by any means. It was actually hatred and contempt between Jews and non-Jews. But these Jews felt good about this Roman centurion. They measured his worthiness on the basis of everything he had done for them. Their measurement had to do with outward size. Well, Jesus didn't question or hesitate at all to, this, to respond to this request. And he began traveling with the entourage of the Jewish elders towards the centurion's home. But for Jesus or any other Jew to enter into the home of a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, would have meant instantaneous defilement. So the centurion sends another group of men to stop Jesus from coming to his house. Perhaps the centurion understood enough about the Jewish faith that he didn't want Jesus to enter into his house and therefore become religiously contaminated. The centurion's message is profound. It reveals that the centurion saw himself as an unworthy, unclean Gentile presence. But as it continues, it reveals an astonishing faith in Jesus' prophetic power. Just as the centurion knows as a ruler over a hundred soldiers underneath him, that his words to those that he commands will be carried out because he wields power and authority over them. So he says he knows that a spoken word from Jesus will heal his servant because of the power and the authority that Jesus has received from God. And even though the centurion does not understand Jesus' identity. He still has faith in the power and authority that Jesus carries with him. The centurion was expressing an understanding of Jesus that is rare, coming from those who were surrounding Jesus 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> if we're honest about it, sometimes we tend to think that our own worthiness in God's sight is dependent upon what we do or what we achieve. <clears throat> I was asked as recently as last week, did you finish your doctorate, Mark? And I said, yes, I did, three years ago. Oh, excellent. So did you get a promotion? I said, why? Well, because you got your doctorate. You, you. And they were astounded. I said, no. Well, why did you do it? Why did I spend several years getting my doctor? If it wasn't for a promotion, if it wasn't for a higher pay, if it wasn't because I felt that people should reward me. We do that all the time, don't we? We expect what we do and what we achieve will mean that we're worthier in God. That was the basis of the Jewish elders' appeal to Jesus on behalf of the Roman centurion. Consider him worthy of your compassion, Jesus, because of what he has done for them. And if this becomes the basis of our worthiness, what we do and what we achieve, then we are reducing faith in God to a barter system. And that is not at all what the Christian faith is about. We don't, or we're not supposed to, but we do, we're not supposed to go around holding out before God. See God, I've been good this week. Look at all that I did this week. I didn't hit my brother. I was good to my parents. I obeyed almost everything my parents said to me. I didn't swear too much. I helped. I, 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 I. We hold up to God everything that we have done in hopes that He'll find us more lovable and more worthy. 
Faith in God is not a barter system at all. We don't barter with God for a place in his family. My sons, when they started to grow up and recognize that they were part of a family, didn't start to say, please, please, can I be your sons if I do this and if I do that? It's not a barter system. We don't earn a place in God's kingdom by our actions or by our words. It is all a matter of God's free grace. And none of us are worthy of God's grace. And that stings a bit because we like to earn our worth with other people. Therefore, we like to try to earn our worth with God. We can't be good enough. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough for God to earn it. None of us is worthy of the grace of God. So while there's a sense in which we are what we do, we are never enough, though, that worthiness in God's sight is dependent upon you or me or what we do or achieve. Instead, the New Testament describes it beautifully with a fancy word in Romans, imputed. We are given Christ's worthiness as our own. Completely replaces our own unworthiness. Isaiah talks about this as well. How God takes away our best offerings is like filthy rags. And he replaces them with Christ's pure garment of righteousness. And that brings us back to the centurion's perception of himself and his own worthiness. Other people considered him worthy because of what he did. He saw himself from the inside. And that made a huge difference. It helped him to understand faith. Jesus declared that this Roman centurion possessed a faith greater than anybody he'd ever found in all of Israel. The ultimate outsider, the despised Gentile, and worse, he was one of the foreign occupiers, a leader in the Roman army. This centurion was proclaimed to be more faithful than anybody who was on the inside of the inside track of God's people. The crowd that Jesus spoke to then would have been shocked to hear that this ultimate outsider is declared to have greater faith than those who always believed that they were the ultimate insiders, the chosen people of God. The centurion trusted Jesus enough to just say the word and there will be healing for his servant. The centurion had a just say the word of faith. Incredible and simple and profound faith. The truth is, in spite of all his tribal and Torah-based identity as a Jewish man, Jesus was trackless. The scripture says in the Gospels that birds have their nests and foxes have their holes, but the Son of God had no hope. Son of God intentionally and continually meandered across all the lines that were divided by different tracks. <coughs> he didn't care where he went. He meandered across everything that separated all the barriers that divided people. Jesus had no home ground. Or more precisely, Jesus made all ground holy ground. What Jesus did pray for his followers in John's Gospel, in his high priestly prayer, John 17, was that we would be in the world but not of the world, and that we would be of the Spirit, and the Spirit in us. In the first century, for the first Christians, this meant crossing over the tracks, one at a time, that divided Christians from non-Christians. But at the very start, it was what divided Jews 
from Gentiles because the first Christians were Jewish. And it took them a while as they struggled with that to realize that God's grace was working profoundly, just as profoundly in non-Jewish lives as it was in their lives. In 21st century, today, for Christians, this means engaging a world that <clears throat> has no longer any ultimate faith in anything. Today, how much are we defined by our technology? Did you know that there were people who came to church and go to different churches? They're church shopping. And they're looking for specific things. <clears throat> Did you know that some people have not gone back to that church or those churches because they don't have technology? They're looking for specific things. How many people are defined by our technology, our brands, our social network connections. People who have faith in God need to see technologies, the brands, and the variety of social media simply as tools to help people experience God, perhaps, so that they might come to faith in the living Lord Jesus. So if the young generation today, did I just say that? I still think I'm young. <laughs> wow. If the young people today, Anna, Matthew, Sierra, Gwenar, Yehuda, Evan, Jennifer, and others, if you cannot imagine a world today without being connected, if you cannot imagine life without everything at your hand, no matter what it is, then we should be doing things differently. The whole church. If the most meaningful community that some people commit to is only visited when they hit the send button or the return button or the enter button, then followers of Jesus Christ must be accessible that way as well. If no one is doing coffee hour after church, what we do, we're having cake today after church. We coffee time. But if nobody's doing coffee hour after church and they're all hanging out at the coffee shops which offer free Wi-Fi, then Jesus' followers need to be maybe at those coffee shops or building their own coffee shop and offering free Wi-Fi and engaging in conversation, real, down-to-earth, totally non-judging conversations with people. Use the web, surf, Skype, tweet, make the cloud the new cloud of witnesses, as the book of Hebrews says in the New Testament. Do whatever we can, and how much are we doing to try to reach people who are perceived to be on the other side of the tracks? who might never darken the door of a church. The world, no matter how unconnected or unconcerned with Christ it seems to be, the world is never, how much? Never on the wrong side of the tracks. For us, who are followers of Jesus, from chief executive officers to CTDs, CEOs to CTDs. What's a CTD? Those who feel like their lives are circling the drain. <coughs> and everyone in between, the marginal, the maximal, those who hold fast to everything that they can get their hands on, and those who have nothing in their hands. The church is supposed to go where? everywhere that Jesus went, into all the world, regardless of what people may say are the right or the wrong sides of the tracks. So what difference would it make in your life and mine if we had the kind of faith that the centurion had 2,000 years ago? A faith that's so simple and so deep that it would affirm 
Just say the word, Jesus. Can you imagine what the world would be like today if the Christians in the world truly trusted Jesus like that and truly treated everyone the way Jesus treats us? Wow, that's hard to imagine. Let's start imagining.